Owning a home is the American dream. Losing that home to foreclosure is a nightmare. But it's happening to more people than ever before. What we're going to do in the next hour is offer you some concrete steps you can take to make sure that it doesn't happen to you. Hi, I'm Dan Jones from Milwaukee Public Television. We're coming to you live from our studios at the Milwaukee Area Technical College in downtown Milwaukee to talk about a very real problem that is affecting Milwaukee, all of Wisconsin, and the entire country. A powerful collision of various economic factors has caused the perfect storm. Everyone agrees it is a crisis. So that's why we're calling this effort Facing the Mortgage Crisis. Tonight, we are urging anyone who is facing foreclosure right now or sees that on the horizon to please reach out for help, because truly, there is help available. We are asking you to either call 211 or call the My Money Helpline at 1-888-861-3111, where you will be directed to trusted community resources that can offer you assistance at no cost whatsoever. They will steer you to an agency where you will have to make an appointment to go in and discuss your situation. You can also go to our website at mptv.org for additional information or to just click on the very obvious Ask Questions box and we'll try to answer some of those questions tonight. All right, here in the studio we've assembled a panel of experts to talk about this. Let me introduce them. Polly Drew is a psychotherapist. You can imagine the tremendous pressures the possibility of losing your home puts on an individual, a marriage, and a family. Polly is going to offer some advice on how to deal with those very real pressures. Louis Emile Jr. is a housing counselor with HBC Services. He helps guide people through the process once they make the decision to reach out for help. Shar Borg is a realtor with Shore West Realtors. She will talk about the role of the real estate industry in this crisis. And Katie Doyle is an attorney with the Legal Aid Society who will talk about both the rights and the responsibilities that you have under the law. We also have a studio audience and a little bit later they'll have the chance to ask our panel questions as well. Now, we want you to know we did invite members of the banking industry, but for a variety of reasons, they were unable to join us. Okay, now, before we get into the discussion, we want to give you an idea of how big the problem is and what has caused it. In just a while, we're going to put some very real faces behind the numbers. But first, let's just look at the numbers. The numbers don't lie, and the numbers are shocking. The state of Wisconsin is on track to have more than 25,000 foreclosures this year, breaking the record set last year, which broke the record set the year before. It has doubled in just a few years' time. In Milwaukee County, same story. If the trend continues, nearly 7,000 homeowners could go into foreclosure this year. And Ground Zero is right in the city of Milwaukee. In the past year and a half, the four zip codes with the most foreclosures in the entire state are on Milwaukee's north side. The problem is plaguing all neighborhoods and all income levels. It is certainly not confined to poor people who just got in over their heads. Well, it's not true, and it never was true in the city of Milwaukee because, again, m many of the people, the majority of the people who purchased, who got into these subprime loans, they had already had a loan, and they just went in and refinanced. And it was only because someone came to the door, they got the mailing, and said, here, you can have all this extra money, and all you have to do is, is refinance your home. One of the things that surprises people is that the people who are caught in this subprime trap, um, over half of them are people who have been in their homes for, for many years. They're, they could afford their homes, but somehow they allowed themselves to be talked into this subprime mortgage, and that put them in a worse situation. Now, with the loss of jobs and the way the economy is, we're seeing the numbers continue to grow. All Phil Crawford's company does is track foreclosures in Wisconsin. He's watched high housing prices and easy loans collide to cause well, the perfect think, storm. Um, the, the biggest increase is because the, the, the bubble caused prices to be too high. People got into mortgages they really couldn't afford. Um, and so now when the recession is kicking in, they're unable to pay for those, those very large mortgages that they used to purchase the, the homes back in the bubble days. We track foreclosures for the entire state, and we've seen homes above a million dollars that are in foreclosures. So it's, there are 
all, all sorts of people who um, purchase homes, and I, like I said before, often this is because uh, of the bubble and the people were buying homes that they really couldn't afford based on either option arms or, th or other uh, ways to delay payments. Um, they were in mortgages that they actually couldn't afford on top of potentially losing their job over the last couple of years um, and being leveraged too high. I think that the original reasons go back to the subprime lending um, and, and what we call predatory lending, the toxic loans that were given to people who, in many cases, probably more than half of the people actually qualified for a good, reasonably priced loan. Um, those loans were both originally uh, first mortgage loans, but many of the more pro problematic ones that we're seeing were to, uh, loans for people to refinance the existing good loans that they did have to pull some equity, to pull some cash out of those houses, and uh, and those often were the were the bad loans that that replaced the good no loans that they were originally in. So now they're now they got into higher cost loans um, that were not appropriate for their circumstances. In most cases, not all cases, but in in most cases, uh, the folks that got those toxic uh, predatory loans were, act, were, were pressured into, into taking them on. There are an awful lot of people who had uh, a bait and switch kind of situation happening where they were told that they were getting one kind of loan with a certain set of reasonable, um, normal, appropriate features that, uh, that they should have been getting. But when they got to the closing, uh, they realized that this was a different, entirely different thing. And then others didn't even realize it at the closing. Um, they didn't realize it until they tried to refinance out of it they, or, or until they tried to uh, uh, get some assistance in, uh, with the loan and found that what they, the loan that they had been sold was completely different than what they thought they were getting into. Um, and you know, some people wonder, well, how do people get into it? You know, how do you do that? How do you get into a mortgage loan that ha that is so different from what you expect. And um, my answer is, if you think about it, you know, think about back to when you got your home loan and the stack of papers that were put in front of you and whoever it was that was presenting you with that stack of papers, whether it was your realtor or the, or the lender um, or both, you know, they, they said, well, this is what it says here, and this is what it says here, and sign here, and here, and here. And did you actually go through all those documents and read them? Um, most people don't. And the effects of a foreclosure aren't confined to one family in one house. It can hurt a block, an entire neighborhood, and stress the resources of a community. First of all, if you lose on your block, there's nothing worse than having a board up next door to you. And there's nothing worse than having two board ups or three board ups, because in terms of curb appeal in a neighborhood. If you're, walk, if you're walking or driving down the street and you see two or three boarded up homes, it makes it less attractive um, because it sends this message that there's something wrong with this block. So we're being very aggressive in trying to make sure that we don't have long-term board ups. We're putting pressure on the owners of the property to move the, to move the property so that we don't have these board ups. It also uh, creates what we call attractive nuisances. If you've got a, a home that's abandoned, First of all, the grass is less likely to be cut. The snow is less likely to be t shoveled. Um, but in certain neighborhoods, it can attract drug dealers, gangs, prostitutes, and that only compounds the problem. So it, it causes the city to incur more costs, and, and it's just not a good situation for any community whatsoever. Okay, why don't we get into the discussion right away. My first question will be for Lou Emile. Lou, you know, we're directing people to all these different agencies, and they're watching this going, I'm having trouble making my house payment. Can you honestly say that the majority of them, do they have reason to be optimistic? Is, is there help out there? There's help out there, but they have to ask for it. That, that's really the key for the homeowner. You've got to start early in the process. If you know that your income is not going to support this, this mortgage payment long term, you have got to get involved with your lender. And if you're not getting results, then you must quickly find someone, a professional, who can help you. There are throughout the state, uh, and there are websites that will give you their names and addresses. There are nonprofit agencies that will provide free services to you to intervene on your behalf with your lender to try and work towards a, what is called a loan modification. 
where the loan terms are actually modified to make the payment affordable for you, long term or short term. Uh, it's out there, but you have to go and get it, and uh, we're more than happy to help you once we know you're there. Katie Doyle, is it usually a fight? Is, is mediation and asking for help, does it end up being a fight? Well, it varies. Um, uh, these, the housing agencies um, that Lou has mentioned are, are really a tremendous resource for people. And first, I want to make sure people under, be, beware, because if you start getting into trouble, with your mortgage, you will start getting contacted by people who may take further advantage of you. So if you get start getting calls from, from uh, people saying, we can help you, it's going to cost you five thousand, you know, send us two thousand dollars and then we'll work with your mortgage company, don't do it. You should not have to pay for this help. It's available through the, um, the HUD housing agencies and they will do a better job than anyone that's offering to do this to you for a price. Now, is it a fight when you get into it? It can be. There are certain loans that were so predatory that there are a lot of defenses that people can have to foreclosure. It used to be the assumption is, the question just was, did, can you, did you make your mortgage payments or not? But, uh, and that the only defense would be, I can come in and prove I made it. But that is not the case anymore because, as was uh, um, explained by Bethany and other people in the video we just watched, there were many predatory loans that were made, and there are defenses that can be made. But, all, but uh, now we're leaning, going more toward mediation. And Milwaukee County has just set up a mediation program through Marquette University Law School and in the courthouse uh, to provide mediation services for people who are owner, if it's owner occupied, and if the homeowners have a stream of income so that they can afford to make some payments, there is help available to attempt to work out a, some kind of a loan modification that would be affordable uh, for that person. How is that done? Well, they might drop your interest rate. They might extend the term of your loan to reduce your monthly payments to get it down into some affordable range, maybe 38% of your total income. There are guidelines that are used. So I recommend that anyone in Milwaukee County uh, who's in foreclosure um, contact you know, check into this mediation program. I know other counties around the state are beginning to look at having mediation programs. Um, Waukesha, Iowa County, Rock County, Brown County, I, I don't know of all the different counties, but you might want to contact the uh, clerk of courts in your county and ask if there's any mediation programs for you. Because the purpose of the mediation now is to get away from it's to try to get these things early and to get the party, the lender and the borrower talking and productive talks to see how do we put this loan back to work, how do we get it back as a, uh, a, a viable loan with new terms that are going to be affordable. Now, when we first sat down at the, at the station to talk about this project, the first thing that went through my head uh, was I didn't realize how big the problem was. And the second thing that went through my head was I cannot believe how difficult it must be to tell your spouse and to tell your kids, we're losing the house. We're losing the house that we love. Polly, this has to put an incredible amount of pressure sure. on the family dynamic. How, do you have any advice? How can people handle this? Well, you know, <clears throat> I think it's like a lot of other, you know, horrible things that happen in families, you know, death, uh, you know, terminal illness, divorce. You've really got to take a look at yourself and, it, it, and make sure you are taking care of yourself first. You're eating okay. You're sleeping okay. If you're lucky enough to have a spouse or a partner that you're talking to them and really getting them on board and w working as a team, uh, this does put a lot of stress on a marriage. And then, you know, you can talk to your children and of course it's got to be age-appropriate talk you're not going to tell your two-year-old details of your finances but you are going to perhaps tell your 12 year old or your 10 year old or your 8 year old hey we need to cut back um, we may need to move we do need to move and try to keep it as many touchstones as you possibly can in your child's life and in your own life of course try not to change schools if you don't have to keep attending the same church or temple or place of worship, um, keep family and friends around, keep as many constants as you can, and that'll help ease it. It'll, it'll still be tough, I mean, there's no question about it, 
and but once the story is told and some explanation is is given for what's going on because kids are very intuitive they hear the things they they see things that you know we're not always thinking that they're hearing and seeing and once they're told the truth you know a, a, a two-year-old we have to move to a smaller house to a 12 year old hey we got to cut back you know there's relief there's a tremendous amount of relief Shar Borg, let me, let me uh, be an antagonist for a minute. Uh, is some of this problem caused because realtors sold people big houses that they couldn't afford? Um, I think some people bought big houses that they couldn't afford, but um, it's not just big houses, it's small houses, and um, I think there's blame to go around for everyone. Um, actually, to be frank, I think a lot of the blame lies with the people who bought the houses. Um, you know, people needed to be realistic about their own income and about the payments that they could make. A realtor really only has the information that the buyer gives them. I'm not saying that realtors aren't responsible because, you know, realtors have a job too and, and they want to eat, but, you know, there's a lot of blame to go around. I think that there were a lot of people who wanted the great house. I think there were a lot of lenders who were happy to give money. And I think that everybody got away from conventional wisdom. You know, you don't buy a house without putting money down. But if the banks were saying that people could do it, realtors were happy to sell those houses. So, Has that hurt your business tremendously? Um, in what regard? Do you mean the trust factor? Because, because or? so many people are facing foreclosure now. Are people afraid to buy houses? Okay, so we've definitely been on a roller coaster ride. There was a time, I would say, from October until March, people were terrified. Nobody knew what was going to happen. Nobody knew where to buy a house because there were so many foreclosures in certain neighborhoods. Now people were concerned, well, will my property value go down if I buy in this neighborhood? There was a lot of fear from October till March. I have to say that the stimulus package has really, really helped. There are a lot of first-time home buyers out there who now are qualified first-time home buyers, um, who have money to put down, who are benefiting from the stimulus package, and then the entire market is benefiting from that. Good. It's nice to hear some good news. Mm -hmm. You know, I promised you earlier we would put some faces behind the numbers, and we're going to start doing that right now. When this crisis was in its early stages, I think a lot of people, including myself, dismissed some of these folks, a lot of them, by saying, well, they shouldn't have bought a house in the first place, they didn't have a good job, they didn't have a good income, so it's their own fault, period. Well, as our Everett Marshburn is about to explain, it is not always that simple. The name of my company is Christian DeGray Couture slash MyFlowerGirls.net. I'm a fashion designer. Um, currently, I'm designing special occasion wear for children, um, for teenagers, prom dresses. And um, just recently, I'm adding a bridal, bridesmaid dress line to my business. Um, I've been a designer for 30 years. Joyce Gray was a successful businesswoman for decades but it was the internet that put her company into high gear. With the whole internet um, boom that was going on, it was really, I just couldn't believe it, that people were actually calling me on the phone to order dresses. So being a businesswoman, I decided to invest into more sewing machines. I bought tons of fabric, and I started to ask the customers just to send me the measurements, and I, w I had about maybe 20 pictures of different designs, and. I never looked back from that. Within, I would say, two years of doing business on the internet, I had managed to save up a nice amount of money. And so that started my whole thing of becoming a homeowner because I had never owned a home through all those years. And so I decided I wanted to have my own home, somewhere I could work from. I could also have my mom here with me because she was getting older. And I embarked on that journey, and I went at it. Um, business got better. On average, I was probably selling about 100 dresses a month. Business was good, but other problems soon surfaced. I would say the third year in, um, health, I had no health care. I never had health insurance. I couldn't afford it. I never got sick. I just tried to take care of myself, but I had some tumors. And within one year, they went from the size of a lemon to the size of an eight month baby. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I had to go through tests. I was working with Columbia St. Mary's and my doctor is Dr. Seidel. And I have to say this because if it was not for him, I might be dead. 
I didn't have no health care. But he saw me anyway. We figured out that it wasn't cancer. And through that whole process, I had to pay. I had to pay for biopsies. They decided they wanted to give me some shots to try to shrink the tumors at $200 a shot. So I had to start paying for those. I had to pay for x-rays. I had to pay for medication. So one of my medications was $400. I think a little bit over $400. So it didn't take long to go through my reserve savings. Decided that I was going to need major surgery. I was losing too much blood. Went through the surgery. On the other side of it, they got the tumors. They weren't cancerous. But then I had a medical bill over my head. Didn't know what to do. I had, couldn't work for four months. When I was able to start working again, I had no more money. The business, I had to try to restart it. And that started this whole journey of running behind the bills, trying to get on top of them again. I was about a year behind when the foreclosure process started. I think I had made maybe one or two payments during that year. I felt ashamed. That's the first thing, because I kept blaming myself. If I hadn't have gotten sick, did I do the wrong thing by purchasing the home? You know, did I do, you know, I just blame myself for something that was beyond my control. But she didn't give up. She looked for help. I found out about an organization called Acorn Housing, and they were supposed to be able to help to renegotiate my mortgage. I had nowhere else to turn, so I went to them. It took a while. It took a lot of patience. It took me just to keep thinking positive, but they managed to renegotiate my mortgage. My mortgage was over $1,500. Now it'll be around $950, and I probably can even get it a little less if I can lower my escrow sign. Most people feel ashamed, and they're not reaching out for help because of it. On TV, all you hear is, if their homes are in foreclosure, it's because they're irresponsible. I was not irresponsible. Once again, our main purpose tonight is to drive you to trusted nonprofit resources that can offer you free assistance. The numbers to call are 211, that is in every county in Wisconsin, and they are on alert tonight that the call volume will be high. Another option for those in southeastern Wisconsin is the My Money Helpline. That number again, 1 888 861 3111. Now, you don't have to call tonight. If you find yourself in a better position to make the call tomorrow or the next day, just do it then. There's a great deal of information on our webpage at mptv.org. You can also go there right now and click on the Ask Question box to ask us a question right now. All right, why don't we start taking questions from our audience, and why don't we have the first question from Joyce Gray, who was just featured in that story. Joyce, thank you. Hi, my name is Joyce Gray. Um, I just want to say, too, to the people that are watching, um, when I did finally make that phone call, it felt like, a uh, 10,000 pound weight was lifted off of me because up until that point um, I was in fear and like I said blaming myself. My question to the panel is this now in the aftermath um, because they have lowered my mortgage now but my credit score is shot and where do I go from there? Um, I'm at a point it seemed like the three numbers now are defining me when you're not seeing they don't see my story so then they almost treat you like, you know, you're a bad person. And it just seemed like that those three numbers shouldn't have that kind of power over me when clearly, if you saw my story, this, none of this was my fault. It's totally out of my control. So that's my question. Where do I go from here? Why don't we start with Lou? Uh, there are credit counseling agencies throughout the state that will help you rebuild that credit. You'll have to do some very specific things. You used the word patience earlier, I believe, in, in the video clip. That's one of the keys. That is one of the keys to this whole entire mess. Uh, you have to be patient while they work through your numbers. That You have to be patient while they try and come up with a solution. You have to be patient in your case now. One, she was fallen. Now we need the other one to come forward, and that is the, the credit scores. And, and that is going to require a longer-term patient approach, but it can be done, okay? Uh, the world doesn't end, as you know. It keeps going. And for those who are out there that, that think that it has because they're now a payment or two or about to become behind on their mortgage, it, it hasn't ended. It's a matter, it's a start point. Make a call to an agency that can help you. You will have to 
go through your, your uh, files or find your files or create files to bring in some documents. You're going to have to give us information that probably you really don't want to do, but we need that in order to build the case. That's probably going to be true with the credit counseling as well, Joyce. Uh, but it's there. So find a good credit counseling agency, call them, sit down with them, and start the process. That's all it takes. You've got to start the process. Katie Doyle, for the most part, does the law in Wisconsin, in these kind of situations, give the person who needs the help opportunities at all? Um, well, in the Wisconsin foreclosure law uh, is a, first of all, Wisconsin is a judicial foreclosure state, which means that in order to, um, to, have a for, to be foreclosed on, the lender has to commence a court action. There are other states in which they don't even have to do that. They can just, uh, they do it without any court intervention. So Wisconsin, in Wisconsin, um, I, our homeowners are lucky that they have a few more protections through the court system. So you will receive a summons and complaint. If you live in Milwaukee County now, you're also going to receive a notice that will tell you how to get into the mediation program that is required now to be served with a summons and complaint, but just in the single county at the, at the present time. Uh, once that happens, there are options available. People have to be very cognizant of the deadlines. If you get served with a summons and complaint, uh, you only have 20 days and within which to file an answer. And be sure that you do, it has to be in a written form if you, want, if you, if you feel you have defenses to this. Um, I would suggest if you'd like to talk to an attorney, the State Bar of Wisconsin is beginning uh, to, to put together uh, a list of attorneys who will, be, who will uh, talk to people around the state who are in foreclosure and assist them um, either on a pro bono sliding scale basis. So you can contact the State Bar of Wisconsin if you live in Milwaukee County, the Milwaukee Bar Association. We soon will have uh, an intake person at Legal Aid that will be just, just taking calls from Milwaukee County. Um, but once that happens, you know, there are options and um, the process is that if they get a de judgment, say a default judgment or a summary judgment of foreclosure, in Wisconsin the homeowners have a six-month redemption period. So you, d that I think it's very important for people to understand that if you just you know, if you get that, it, um, summons and complaint, it doesn't mean the sheriff's going to come and put you out uh, in two weeks or the next day. And often the lenders, the, the, uh, for some of the loan servicing companies, the lenders are bill collectors. So they will frighten you. They want you to start paying money. So they'll say, well, the sheriff's going to come and put you out if you don't start sending in money. This is why people get paralyzed. Understand that in the state of Wisconsin, that is not how it's going to work. You're going to have at least a six-month redemption period and time to work with your lender and attempt to get into one of these loan modification programs. The, there is the Obama plan now. There are other plans that lenders have to try to get people back on track with their mortgage if it's possible. Obviously, if people are, don't have the income to get their loan back on track, they're going to have other, um, they're going to need different kind of counseling. But just rest assured, sometimes when people come to us, that is the most important thing they hear is that it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen next week. There's at least six to eight months here where you can uh, figure out a strategy to either get your loan back on track or find other housing that's going to be affordable for you and your family. Lou, you wanted to add something. The, you have to understand that within a, within a bank or, or a lender institution, there are different departments. One is the collection. One is the foreclosure, and the other was called loss mitigation. They don't talk to each other, okay? So you have to know who you're talking to when you call the bank. And the loss mitigation process, which ultimately leads to the loan modification, that is an ongoing process that parallels the foreclosure process. At the point that you hit the loan modification agreement, and all parties have agreed to it and instituted it, the foreclosure shuts down. That stops it. So it, it's not that the foreclosure now means you have no options. It simply means there's now a defined timeline. And within that timeline, we can do a great deal as intervention specialists to work with the banks to get you to that loan modification. So don't, don't panic at the sight of the paper. Understand that you now have a guaranteed time, unlike other states, as Katie was mentioning, Texas, I believe, is non-judicial. From the time they post it on your door to the time the sheriff arrives can be three weeks. 
and we're talking six to eight months here. So don't, don't get panicky. Understand you now have a timeline. Let's work with it. Let's get it done. Shar, you wanted to mention something? And speaking of that timeline, this would be a great time actually to rely on a realtor. I mean, a realtor can really help you at this point because some people go through this foreclosure process and they think that's it. I'm just going to lose my home. Or if they get into a situation where they can't get the loan modified, you can actually put your house on the market and do what's called a short sale. Okay, this is pre-foreclosure. And we were talking about people's credit scores being affected. Your credit score is actually not hurt as badly when you sell the house for less than you owe on it as it is when you foreclo actually foreclose on the house. So a realtor can actually help you through this process. I have sold I don't know how many houses in short sale. And so you know what ends up happening is you sell the house for less than you owe on it. You work that out with the bank too. And frankly, the bank would much rather have you short sale the house than to foreclose on it entirely. Okay. You know, when you stop and think about it for just a minute, 25,000 people losing their homes just this year, just in Wisconsin. You realize that this is happening to a lot of people. It could be the woman who checks you out at the grocery store, the guy driving the bus that takes you to work. Once again, let's put some faces behind these numbers. Here's a story from our own Patricia Gomez. Latinos are one of the most vulnerable groups during this time of crisis in home mortgage payments. Their lack of knowledge of English and of the housing system in the U.S. has made them easy victims for unscrupulous companies that offer unfair credit. The main one would be the language barrier, the lack of familiarity with the home purchasing system in the U.S., and also their immigration status in the country. It carries great risk. The initial reason for losing a home is reduction of income. The loss of employment is currently, due to the economic crisis, one of the most common reasons. Divorce is still one of the most common ones. When did the problem start with the house payments? We started having problems and ended up getting divorced. I no longer had economic support from my ex-husband, and I started falling farther and farther behind. I couldn't make the house payments. There were times I couldn't even buy groceries and the electric and the water bills. It all piled up. What were the steps you took in this process of saving your home? I sought help through a friend who referred me to Rocia Juarez. Rocia Juarez, housing counselor at the HBC Services, explains the kinds of cases her agency handles and at what stage of the process. I've helped modify loans for 30 clients, which is 16 percent of my cases. In progress awaiting an answer from the investor are 55 people, which is 29 percent of the cases. Unfortunately, five homes have been lost, which is 2 percent. But of these properties that were lost, only two belonged to Hispanic families. There are currently seven homes in the process of short sale, which is 3 percent. There were 17 people, 8 percent of our cases, who didn't come back. That is, they came in but later decided they didn't like the program or decided not to continue. And there are 72 people, 37 percent of caseload, who have had the initial session and are in the process of bringing in documents. Could you tell us what interest you had in your prior contract? Well, my situation started out badly because my mortgage started raising the interest a lot, to the point that it went up to almost 12 points. My monthly payment was $1,378, and my salary was $1,400, so there was no way I could solve this economic problem. Comparatively, how did the interest percentage change? From 12 points to 3 points. What were your monthly payments under the prior contract? 
Mi contrato quedó gracias a Dios y gracias a My contract, Dios, thanks to God and to the person who helped me, ended up being a 30-year mortgage, but with a very low monthly payment of $716. It went from $1,378 to $716. Uh, the essence of the American dream is owning your own home. Rocia Juarez tells us how President Obama's program has benefited those who are eligible because of the type of credit used in the purchase of their home. Making home affordable is a more flexible program. For example, previously they didn't accept unemployment compensation income, but now they do. Sometimes they used to tell us, no, we can't lower the interest rate any further. The only option is a refinancing, but now they're doing the modifications and we're getting a lot of responses. Many undocumented families got credit to buy homes. These families are being helped, too. Of course. Everyone can qualify. It will also depend on the investor and the bank. So far, I've had no problems for people in that situation. We've helped all families. I learned that there are a lot of good people out there who are willing to help. Someone referred me to Rocio, and it was a blessing. For Rocio, her work has a positive side as well as a very difficult one. The best thing is the satisfaction of being able to help a family stay in their home. And the hardest thing is when we're powerless to help. What have these experiences meant to you in your life, and how do you see the future? I feel much better now, because now I can make my payments without falling behind, without having to ask for help. I feel very good. If you are at risk of losing your home, contact HBC Services at 414-727-5700. HBC Services is located at 10533 West National Avenue, Suite 300, West Dallas, Wisconsin, 53227. All right, let's continue the discussion now, spend some more time taking questions from our audience and from our email. They're starting to roll in. But first, a reminder that the numbers to call to be directed to agencies for some guidance are 211 statewide. Another option for folks in southeastern Wisconsin is the My Money Helpline. That number again, 1-888-861-3111. Again, this information is all on our webpage at mptv.org. All right, time for more questions. And I have a question for Polly Drew. Polly, every time I've talked to a housing counselor about this, and I'm sure Lou would agree, they said people have to get over this hurdle. They can't just ignore this is happening to them. Right. They get envelopes, and they don't open them. Oh, yeah. The, the, the phone rings, and they say, I'm not answering it. How do you get over the mental hurdles so you yes, open question. the envelope and answer the phone call? Yeah, it's paralyzing and overwhelming. And, uh, you know, that fight-flight response comes in where, you know, you just want to pull the covers over your head and pretend like it's not happening. I think everybody knows that this is not going to go away and um, sometimes you do need some extra help and by calling some of these numbers that we're tossing out not only is there help for financial you know resources but there's also mental health help and it's not unusual to start to feel hopeless and helpless and you know like this thing is just taking on a life of its own and so sometimes a little counseling uh, maybe even you know some medication if there's medical you know reasons for it uh, to help you through this time. Um, it's overwhelming for anybody. Anybody would feel it. And, um, but taking, as we've all said, taking that first step and asking for help. You can, you know, call your doctor. You can call, you know, go to a clergy person, make a call to 211 or any of these other numbers we're talking about. All of them have referrals for low cost or free mental health services. All right, why don't we take our first email question and then we'll get another audience question. This one is from Susan. She said, I submitted a loan modification request in May of 2009. My lender started to review my request at the end of July. I was told this process can take an additional 90 days to complete. In the meantime, I'm falling behind on all of my bills. Is this a standard process? Katie. Yes, unfortunately it is. Um, I think that uh, what has happened is that the system is so overwhelmed and many of these are, uh, you're dealing with loan servicers. It's not actually your lender. It's a servicer that, that takes your payments and deals with the, um, 
uh, collection on your loans. Your loan is probably owned by an investor. Um, and so the system is, is just so overloaded. In addition, when you submit those papers for your loan modification, the loan servicer may have to get the uh, okay of an investor or several investors uh, who actually own your loan. So there might be a whole group of, of uh, companies that have to review these things. Uh, it is not at all uncommon for this process to take six to 10 months uh, to be able to get responses. And so as Lou said, patience is a very important uh, term uh, here. And um, you know, you just have to hang in there, uh, work with a counselor, and provide the information that, that is being asked. Sometimes you'll get all your paper in there and then they'll call you back two months later and say, well, we, don't, we don't have it, we lost it. You gotta start all over again. But it does work. There are many people who are getting their loans modified but it is not uncommon for it to take six or more months to get a response. All right, well maybe I can get out of the way and, and see if there's another audience question. Bethany. Bethany Sanchez, I work at the Metropolitan Milwaukee Fair Housing Council and I work on these issues every day. I'm really grateful for this program and for the emphasis on the fact that there is help. Um, if people ask for help, there is good, appropriate, professional, free help that they can access but I'm really getting alarmed that a lot of the, uh, there's a lot of people out there that are approaching borrowers who are in distress or even people like me, because I, I have a great mortgage and I'm not behind, and as far as I know, not about to be behind either, but um, my husband and I get come-ons all the time in the mail, sometimes on the phone, from people who say, I can get you a better deal. I can work with you to do something better for you and get, get you a better deal on your mortgage. Um, and some of them, for some reason, think that I am in default and say, I can help you, you know, avoid foreclosure. Um, they've got the wrong, their information wrong, but some of them are really slick. I mean, they have really slick l websites. Some of the mailings have the HUD logo on it, or they say that this is your um, economic, economic stimulus and you're about to lose out if you don't take advantage of it now. So my question is, what do you tell people in terms of how to evaluate whether this is something that's legitimate or not? It comes down to money. Uh, stop and think for a minute. You're having trouble making your mortgage payments, you're probably having trouble making your credit card payments, and you may be having trouble putting food on the table. And you have a choice to pay someone X thousands of dollars who says they may be able to do this for you, or you can find a nonprofit agency that's approved by, by HUD who will do the same thing for you for free. Hmm, okay. Now, let's go one step further. The odds are that there is nothing that that person can do that the, uh, the trained professionals at the HUD nonprofits can't do better. No one can guarantee the results of a process. They cannot. And if they are telling you that, they're lying. And if you want to give your money to a liar, then feel free, but I think it's rather foolish. All right, how about another email question? This is from Glenn. My loan is a high interest rate of 10.58% and I had gotten behind due to large unexpected expenses. I talked to my lender and they were no help at all. I asked for a loan modification to reduce the interest rate and I was told I don't make enough money to afford my home, but I've been living here for 17 years. Is there any way to get my lender to reduce my rate to make my loan easier to pay? Katie? Well, first thing I would suggest, and we keep uh, saying this, but that's because it's the best thing to do. Uh, go on uh, to the WIDA website or the HUD website and find a HUD certified housing counselor near you and contact them. You will find that they have, they, those agencies have contacts within lenders. They may get a better result than you do when you're just doing it on your own. Because they might know who, you know, somebody, they have a relationship with somebody at that particular loan servicing company and they may be able to get you a better response. They may be able to package uh, your, the, the papers that you're putting there uh, in, a, in, a more, in a way that's going to be more acceptable to your lender. So you're going to need help. Um, that is one thing that I really encourage people to do because often the lenders will just start sending you offers. And um, we had this happen recently that, that somebody got sent an offer and they said, 
I'll take it for a loan modification. Well, then they said, well, now send in the paperwork. Well, the paperwork came in, and then the lender said, well, now, um, now that we've seen that, we're, gonna, we're not going to do this. But the, if that individual had had the help of Lou or the, the Fair Housing Council, ACORN, the various groups that do this, HBC, um, then they, will, they, they could package that better and get it in, in a format that's going to be more acceptable to the loan, uh, to the lender, the loan servicer. Uh, so it's so important uh, in this particular case that you described, please contact somebody who will help you resubmit your papers for the loan modification. That is one thing that is very upsetting uh, is that there was so little underwriting that was being done during the period of time when these subprime loans were just so, uh, you know, the cra it was going crazy, um, that now people are saying, well, you gave me this loan. Right. Now you won't modify it because you're telling me I don't have enough income. Well, I ha had enough income to refinance or buy this house. So now they're doing the underwriting that they perhaps should have been doing three years ago or four years ago when, I, when people were refinancing. That's really frustrating. I find that real frustrating to me. All of a sudden they're saying, well, your income isn't enough. But the other thing to be uh, aware of too is that you may not be count counting your income quite right. Maybe the things that you're putting down, maybe it's not your gross income, maybe you didn't include everything. That's why you need that professional help for you to fill out the, the forms that they're asking. Char, you wanted to add something. Well, let's be clear about this. Not everybody is going to get the loan modification. This is a very legitimate question that I get from people all the time who call me. Char, I'm in foreclosure. They're sending me these letters. You know, I'm trying to modify my loan. Now they're telling me I can't even afford my house anymore when three years ago they told me I could. This would really be a good time to talk about doing a short sale. That's a very real option for people because sometimes these banks will not work fast enough and you find yourself in a situation where now you're not making your mortgage payment, you, you can't make your credit card payments, you can't put food on the table. You need to get out of this house and a realtor can really help you with that. You know, a lot of people think that realtors were the bad guys here. And to be fair, there were some realtors who were bad guys. But let's be clear on this. A realtor never gave anybody any money. That was the bank, okay? And now that same bank is telling you, yeah, I'm not going to modify your loan. I wanted all that interest, and now I'm not going to modify it. A realtor can really help people to get out of these situations and to move on in life. Let me, let me ask you a question based on, on what you just said. I'm not saying people should take advantage of other people's misery, but because of this foreclosure crisis, are there a lot of homes on the market right now that are available for much less than they were a few years ago? Are there a lot of deals out there? Or do people have to be careful buying a foreclosed property? It really can be, um, it can be bittersweet, but it can be a best case scenario um, for somebody who's in foreclosure because there are a lot of really qualified buyers out there who want a deal. Everybody's looking for the foreclosure or the pre-foreclosure. So better to sell your house to someone. Take the short sale. Sell the house for a little less than maybe you paid for it. Move on with your life. Maybe have your credit not affected um, as tremendously as if you go through foreclosure. And then the buyer is very happy, too, because they're getting a great house for a great price. Absolutely. Uh, could I just add something to that, too? In the city of Milwaukee, uh, there is this program for people to buy foreclosed homes because mm -hmm. it's so important that owner occupants get back into these homes. It is not good for the community or for anybody else's property values to have empty boarded out up homes sitting in neighborhoods. There are programs where you can get up to $15,000 or more uh, grants for down payments on, for, on homes that are, have gone through foreclosure. And the City of Milwaukee website has an interactive map where you can actually go on and find the houses that are um, foreclosure sales and if you're a first-time home buyer and you're willing to stay in the home for five years you can get these really very large down payment grants in addition if you do act quickly you can get the eight thousand dollar stimulus money for first-time home buyers you can get yourself a really nice down payment and buy a house for uh, a very reduced price so there are some good programs at least within the city of Milwaukee and I suggest this is true probably out in the state too, for people to, to buy those homes and 
there, there, there shouldn't be a reluctance to do that because there are many cases, just as you point out, where people are not going to be able to save their homes. That is very true. And it's important to get owner occupants back in those houses so that they don't become a blight on the neighborhood. Why don't we, why don't we take another audience question? Um, hi, my, my name is Christy Luzar and I work for the Urban Economic Development Association. And we've been talking a lot about people who are looking for help for foreclosures. Um, but when Bethany was talking, I was thinking about what about homeowners who are current in their mortgages, but they're getting a lot of offers to refinance or modify. If you're a homeowner who's current but are considering this, can you still go to a counseling agency for assistance and advice? Yes. <laughs> uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, th there is a caveat here. Most lenders are not going to be dealing with people who are current. There is an attitude of, well, you're making your payments, so what's the problem? Uh, however, the one, a couple of things happen with the stimulus program. Depending on who owns your loan, and this is a hard concept for most people to understand. I make my payments to Bank X. Yes, but Bank X is only doing a service for Joe Blow, who actually owns it as an investment. If your loan is owned by Fred, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and now FHA, as of the 15th of August, they announced their own modification program and you are current, there is a streamlined refinance, key phrase, streamlined refinance opportunity through those two agencies to go back to your lender, not through an agency, go back to your lender and see if you qualify to have your rate, lo your payment lowered through a waterfall effect of combination of lowered rate, extended term, uh, not forgiven, but displaced uh, principal. So if you are current, if you think you're gonna have problems, if you, and you can go to freddiemac.gov, fannymae.gov. There's a way to find out if they own your loans, okay? Just follow the prompts, it's very easy. If they do, you go right back to your lender and you say, I'm owned by Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, I want to streamline refinance and see if you can qualify. All right, well, we only have a few minutes to go, so I'd like to take the time to ask each one of our panel members, do you have any final thoughts as to what's the most important thing people have to remember as they, as they begin the process and navigate these very difficult waters. Polly. Oh, thanks for starting with me. Well, you know, the old adage, home is where the heart is. So, I, you know, I think that that's really important right now, that a home is something that is, can be bought and sold. You see signs all over, you know, the place of, of homes that have, you know, are for sale and sold. And uh, that happens all the time, but your family, uh, the people that you love, your friends, your your support group, your community even, is is really your home. Lou? You've got to ask for help. Uh, you've got to find out exactly what your situation is and uh, how to prove nonprofit counselors can help you do that. There is not necessarily a happy ending, but there is an ending and you can either try and control that ending or you can be faced with it out of the blue. I suggest you pick up the phone and make a phone call. Sure. I would say we didn't get into this overnight. We're not going to get out of it overnight. We didn't get into it by ourselves. We're not going to get out of it by ourselves. There are many, many resources from credit counselors to not-for-profit organizations to realtors to lenders. And we're all going to have to work together to get out of this crisis together. Katie, just a minute. Uh, I would say uh, echo everything that's been said and tell people the earlier you start to ask, the earlier you pick up that phone, the less time that's gone from the time when you maybe haven't made a payment, um, the, the better off you're going to be. One other thing I would suggest is don't forget, sometimes people get so caught up uh, in trying to pay their mortgage, they let other bills go. Keep in mind you're always going to have to make a housing payment. So if you stop if the mortgage company stops taking your payments, set something aside so that for each month so that, that you keep that in mind. But get help, and the earlier you can get the help, the better off you'll be, and the more opportunity you'll have to rectify the situation. Okay, so keep this advice in mind, and remember, there is light at the end of the tunnel. One last time, let me plug those phone numbers that you can call for help. Again, 211, that is statewide in every county. The My Money Helpline is another option for those in southeastern Wisconsin. That number, 1-888-861-3111. And all of this information we've talked about tonight is on our webpage at mptv.org. To our panel, I would like to say thank you so very much for your expertise and your kindness. Polly Drew, Lou Emile, Charbourg, Katie Doyle, 
We truly appreciate it. If it turns out we were able to offer you some assistance tonight, please let us know. If we made a mistake, we screwed something up, something didn't work correctly, let us know that as well. From the day we started planning this project, our number one hope was that we could get people in touch with the right agencies that might just be able to help them save their homes. We know it can be a difficult journey, a very difficult journey, and we wish you nothing but the best as you begin it. Good night. Thank you.